Welcome to PowerPod. I'm your host for today, Angeline Gitonga. And on today's series, uh, we are having the series uh, on 16 days of activism, particularly on women human rights defenders who go out of their way to make sure that uh, violence against women and girls is is uh, is eliminated. And today with us, we are going to narrow down our topic up to the role of different stakeholders when it comes to improving the protection mechanisms for women human rights defenders. And today in the house, we have one and only, or one and only, uh, Jerry Migui. <laughs> she's, my, she's my huge hero. <laughs> I'm just moved and mesmerized by what she does. I don't know how she does it, but we'll get to know more about her and also get to also analyze what you're doing on today's podcast. Yeah, Thank Karibu you. sana. Thank you very so, much. Who is Njeri Megui? Njeri Megui is one, a feminist, um, an intersectional feminist, to be correct, a woman human rights defender. Um, I'm passionate about women, I'm passionate about girls, and I'm passionate about justice. And I'm passionate about equality and restoration of human dignity. Oh, wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a cat, mum. <laughs> so you love cats? Yes, I do. Oh. I have four. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, people say what? And I'm a mother to, to human people. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's quite interesting. So how did you find yourself in that space? Um, to be honest, I, I, I think I stumbled into, into human rights. When you think about it, I wasn't really out there thinking I'm actively fighting for human rights. I was just there thinking I'm doing the right thing in, 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 in making sure that women access certain things. So, yes, that's how my journey started. I used my voice on social media, particularly Facebook, to amplify things and issues that I felt were facing society in, in, in terms of women and girls. And... On my way to doing that, I left my job, mm. my paying job, and started working now actively within Usikimia uh, around GBV, which is part of actually human rights. Oh, okay. Mm. So you had to left to leave, sorry, to leave your job for to be a woman human rights defender, yeah? Yes. And how have you been surviving from that? Oh, it's hard. <laughs> side hustle. Ooh. I'm a Kenyan. Side hustle. Yeah. yeah but mm. really, um, when it comes to human rights, human rights for me doesn't really pay like that. Mm -hmm. But the payment is in actually seeing justice, in actually seeing your survivors being taken care of and accessing whatever services that they need to access. As I said, I work in GBV. So for me, mm -hmm. I work with survivors. And so for me, when I look at survivors where they have a safe place to go, because part of the work we do is to ensure that we, we do the whole cycle of GBV from the rescue part to taking them to hospital, to the police, to now taking them to our safe houses. We have safe houses and to now going to court. So we, mm -hmm. do, we cover the whole cycle okay. yeah, from response to protection. Okay, so mm -hmm. you mentioned about uh, seeking justice for, mm -hmm. for the survivors mm -hmm. and for those that are f affected by the GBV, mm -hmm. but what barriers have you faced while uh, seeking for justice, especially with the judicial system, for these individuals? Um, first of all, cases take very long, very, very long. That's one thing that you need to understand that. As a, as a, as a judicial process, you will find that you start a case today, it can end in five years, six years, ten years. So one of the things that we're really fighting for is to look at, uh, you know, necessarily narrowing the gap and making these cases as fast as possible because what happens is witnesses die. Even the people remember that everything in this country is bailable. We fought for the right for every person to have bail. So what happens in GBV is that most of the time, the perpetrator, once he does the crime, he goes and gets bail, goes back to the community and threatens the very same people that he did the crime to. And so as such, people start fearing even going to court. We had something called uh, minimum mandatory sentencing, and it was overturned in July of this year by Justice Otunga. So now what is happening is... When we had minimum, minimum, those minimum mandatory sentencing is you knew, for example, if somebody had raped, let's say, a child of five years, they stood to get 20 years in court. Now, that has been overturned. So what is happening is... Why was it overturned? Um, 
because mm-hmm. perpetrators came together and mm-hmm. went to court mm-hmm. and uh, because of something else that had happened that had made the death penalty no longer valid, they used that to overturn and overthrow this ruling as an unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. So now it's at the discretion of the judge on what sentencing to give. And the sentencings right now, they do not look good. And as such, already you can see, this is all part of things that uh, that happen in judiciary that make now the survivors to already lose faith. Already it's hard enough to prosecute rape in this country because it's so hard. Uh, we have so many hurdles that you have to face uh, before you get you know, a ruling on that. Mm-hmm. And so already now there's a lot of distrust on the judicial process. So those are just some of the hurdles. Yeah. And personally myself... As somebody who's been through the judiciary system, I can see we were protesting and we got arrested. And once we got arrested, um, and they really didn't because they could not really put us out as as part of, um, how do you say, uh, because every person has a right to mm. protest and to picket. Uh, when we went to the police, that is what had been written as our uh, on our charge sheet. Mm-hmm. But when we went to court... Our charge sheet, I don't know how the charge sheet changed between the police and the court. Mm-hmm. So when we went to court, we were accused of, of assembling during COVID. Oh. So you can mm-hmm. see the way things, yeah, yeah things change. They're twisted, Yes, actually. and yeah, so you can mm. see how that could happen to other people and how yeah. they would look at that. Uh, so uh, as you talk, I'm thinking about uh, someone in the grassroots. They're, they're not able to afford the judicial Process. Uh, process. So uh, what is done? Like, are you doing anything for for such people? So what we've been doing, mm-hmm. we've been creating awareness. Yeah. In terms of, it's interesting, we receive calls from all over this country through our, our helpline. So what we have done is that we have created an awareness. It's funny how, how strong social media is and how having a presence in social media means that anybody with a smartphone at any point in this country is able to access because we speak about these things and our activism is largely done through social media. And by humanizing the data and by talking about these cases, it's made somebody who is as far as Rongo, somebody who's as far as Wajir, somebody who's as far as Tana. These are just people who call into us, know that I have a place I can call and somebody to listen and somebody who can actually assist us. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so we do that through referral mapping. Do you get like experts uh, volunteering to help? Like, for example, lawyers? Uh, yes, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. we are a community organization. So basically what we do is we've been asking the community from those places. Like for example, let's say you are from Transoya and you report a case. We are going to, our model is to use the people within that community who can now help us because we can't be everywhere at the same time. However, because this is very much something that we are doing for the community, we speak to the community there and they hold our hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Okay, no, interesting. It's actually, <laughs> uh, this topic is just something else. But we, we are glad that we have people like you who are standing in the gap because I think like, uh, we have many people who, could, who will do what you are doing. So uh, you've mentioned like there's a time you are arrested mm. yeah, and taken to court. A number of times. Yeah. So how often does the criminalization take, take place and what can be done to, to, to reduce that? Um, How often, though? Let me tell you. Mm-hmm. Last year, I was arrested four times. What? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> on different... <laughs> How I took a kushika. Our arrest is part of, um, I think, fighting and agitating for human rights. But now, mm-hmm. the thing is... Um, We have mechanisms that now help work for you as a human rights defender. For example, now when I'm arrested, I know to call Defenders Coalition, to call, um, let's say, for example, uh, the last time I got arrested, I called Bodyface Mwangi, uh, Amnesty. So there are mechanisms within the CSOs, the civil society, that once you're known as somebody who agitates for human rights, that they're able to come and help you. But in the meantime, if you're at the grassroots level and no one knows you, it becomes a problem. Mm-hmm. So what 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 we try to do is to keep on, on, on raising awareness, even within the grassroots, that even as you agitate, you need to know who to call so that you can get the assistance. Because you will be arrested, that's for sure. You will be arrested because, of course, you're speaking truth to power. Mm-hmm. And nobody likes nobody likes that. Yeah. Yeah. And you will be arrested. So the idea is to ensure that even the ones at the grassroots, I am a grassroots organizer myself. So even the people at the grassroots know and have the awareness of what their rights look like. Mm-hmm. 
and how, what to do if you're violated. Yeah. yeah, so that once they do that, then we can amplify for their cause. For example, um, there was a girl who was fighting for a dam that was being soiled in Nahururu, Salama, some called Salama, and she was alone fighting a whole community, uh, fighting mm. a very gigantic um, <clears throat> Chinese farm that was actually soiling and you see for her she didn't have anybody on her side to help to help her with the with the cause mm -hmm. and so they kidnapped her Who so all these things mm -hmm. happen yeah mm -hmm. but luckily I come from near there so it's my father who called me and told me and told me hey there's something happening not very far from our home would you be able to help so we keep on trying to tell people who are agitating when you're speaking truth to power make sure somebody else knows yeah. so that these people can also help and when we are fighting for you because you can't disappear yeah that's true we mm. actually on our previous podcast mm -hmm. uh, our guest was being on the importance of network having networks as yes. you do this work mm. because sometimes you you won't have that uh, connection to like a higher person but yes. friends family will come through in such mm. times that you are in problems mm. so yeah so let's uh, uh, for for our women Human rights defenders, please. Networks, networks are quite important. Very important, yeah. Important, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so as you speak, uh, there it seems like there's a lot, there's a huge gap when it comes to the protection of human women human rights defenders. So, what is the role of government in all this? Since since today's uh, topic is on about the stakeholders' role on protecting the women human rights defenders. You see, the protection of human rights is enshrined in the constitution. So the constitution is mandated and their bodies like Kenya National Human Rights Commission that sit there for the purposes of ensuring that human rights are upheld. But you know, one thing for that to be there and the other thing is, is for you to say there, the government, it's actually the government work to ensure. Because intrinsically, every person, as soon as they're born, they're born with their human rights intact, right? So. It's the purpose of the government to uphold and to ensure that human rights are done. However, as you well know, uh, these things don't always happen like that. So for me, I would say, especially as a woman human rights defender, there's a reason why we, do, we don't just call ourselves human rights defenders and we add women because our challenges are sometimes very different from the challenges of men. Apart from the usual thing that you go through as a human rights defender, which is being arrested and all these things, there is a stereotypical thing that you're also battling as a WHRD, yeah. which, for example, is name-calling, obviously, uh, threats to your family, threats to your own life. And those threats are not necessarily just, I will kill you. This will come with, I will rape you. Yes. Mm -hmm. For women, for most WRHDs, yes, they'll tell you that the threat to, to, to being raped is, is very real. It's something that you will be told. I've had a gun put on my head. I, I know that for a fact that I can be killed. Mm -hmm. But my greatest fear is not being killed. My greatest fear is being raped. Yeah. Because these are threats I, I, I receive a lot. Mm -hmm. We shall rape you so I stop doing this thing. So you stop putting our young men behind bars and things like that. And so you find that... What happens when you follow up with, uh, with the police? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, 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 for example... I, I, I've stopped reporting, I think, at this point. I I now know how to take care of myself in in ways that I shouldn't even know. I'm well versed in digital security. I'm well versed on what roads to go, how to go, how not to go to the office at the same time, same route. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you start developing subroutines yeah. to protect your life. I don't drive because I'm too worried if I drive and then people find out this is my car. Oh. Because mm -hmm. I, I remember when I was sending you somebody put a gun on my head, um, I'd gone to rescue somebody and I did not know that the person was going to rescue, that the, the perpetrator had a gun. And so he put the gun on my head and he knew me from Facebook. He knew my face. He was like, you mm -hmm. think you can come rescue this girl? And that mm -hmm. was really terrifying for me. So, <laughs> so you see already yeah. if your face is known out here and people know what you do, mm -hmm. then it becomes dangerous. So yeah. I feel like the government needs to, to do more in terms of protection. 
And I know it's funny. I'm mm-hmm. talking about the same government that I go agitating against. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it their is, work to yeah. ensure that every citizen of this country is protected under the law mm-hmm. and doesn't go through threats. But those those mechanisms are still not there mm-hmm. and are still not working. But so there are no existing mechanisms under the me- government. Mechanisms yeah. are there. Mm-hmm. And we still keep on agitating for better protection. I, I keep on telling people, and I'll keep on saying this, Kenya has one of the best constitutions. We have some of the best laws, but they're drafted on paper but they are not implemented on the ground. Yeah. So we'd love to see more implementation. Of course, we'd love to see like Kenya Human Rights Commission being given uh, you know, plenty of funding for them to follow up, you know? mm-hmm. uh, but they don't, right? It took a very long time before even the whole, it was until this year that uh, you could even see commissioners that now we have commissioners, but before that, previously, KNHRC did not have commissioners for two years. So what was happening in those two years? And even then, they're still overwhelmed because apart from even thinking of protecting human rights defenders or WHRDs, they still have to do their work, which is to ensure that even the, 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 you, they are upholding the human rights themselves. So, bad. Yeah. So, um, apart from that, apart the, from the government, mm-hmm. we are in the c- civil civil society space. Mm-hmm. So what role does the civil society have towards uh, improving the mechanisms to protect the WHRDs? You see, the work of the civil society is to call out on the failings of the government and to ensure that those failings are not met. And I can say for myself, as somebody who has actively been protected by CSOs, as I said, we have amnesty, we have defenders, all these people have come through for me anytime I have been arrested. So I can say for their part, they are doing their role. And they are, what we need is to strengthen and get a much more active and a much more participatory civil, civil space. I feel like we are not as, you remember, um, you may not remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Try me. No, like I, I keep on thinking, mm-hmm. I was in school, I think. Um, I was in school. How, how in the 90s, there used to be such a vibrant civil mm-hmm. society. And I long for days like that, when we would all hold each, when, you know, I think that is part of the reasons why I joined, you know, the civil, the, the civil, you know, so, the civil space. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I remember, you know, all of them holding together, Wangari Madai protesting, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. uh, and doing all those things. And for me, seeing that and the agitation and the fighting for human rights, it, it gives space in my head. Mm-hmm. But don't don't you think they got maybe discouraged because they are, they're doing a lot of noise and that nothing is happening? Let me tell you, mm-hmm. if we tire of calling out evil, if we tire of calling out every time people are violated and their rights are taken away, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be corrected today. But we have Karura Forest today because Wangari Mathai fought for it. Mm. Right now I can go on a walk. We have Uhuru Park because Wangari Mathai did that thing. Whether or not it impacted at that point, we can see the fruits of that. The fruits of liberation will never come easy. We have, uh, um, you know, uh, we have spaces because people have gone ahead and called out their truth to power, whether it has costed them their lives, whether it has costed them their property, and it will, and it does. But the thing is, we cannot say you're going to stop because they don't listen. We cannot stop until everybody lives their life with fairness, equality, and the freedom that they need to. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, what uh, What role do you think, or rather, how can we reduce discrimination at the national level and also at the community level of the, the WHRDs? Now, this is the thing. Again, networking. Networking mm. is so important because the person at the village has to come together with other people for them to even understand what they're fundamentally fighting for. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the role of every person is different. I could be fighting for a dam. I am fighting for GPV survivors. Mm -hmm. The other person is fighting for climate change. The other person, so the idea is, how do we get all these stakeholders, you know, down from the grassroots to understand that this is a fight for all of us, that you cannot fight alone. Mm -hmm. You can, because if you fight alone, Mm-hmm. But if we join together mm-hmm. and also for their own protection, because again, as I said, anytime you speak truth to power, you're going to agitate somebody. 
So the most important thing I feel for all of us, as people who are in civil society, as people who, women, human rights, especially women, human rights, we need to have each other's back. We need to have safe spaces for ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know, that if something is happening to this person, they know I can, we, we can form a network in such a way that if this person's life is being threatened, we can call them back mm -hmm. and tell them, look, this is what we need to do. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> so uh, I know you, you've talked about the 1990s. You've been in the game for so long. It's, actually, it's not a game. <laughs> I don't know the word to use. But no, the 90s I was in school. I was just uh, looking at these things oh, through the TV yeah, and getting it. inspired. I did not know that now in the 2020s mm -hmm. I will be the person there who will be doing the same things, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but they inspired me and they put the fire burning in my heart. Yeah, and she'll continue even with this generation yes. for like... <laughs> we want to keep on passing the baton. Yeah. yeah. So what would you like to see change the next generation of WHRDs? Um, like something that is not working apart from lack of support from the government. What else would you like to see I want improved? to see, I want to mm -hmm. see young women start to be not just interested but be part of this movement be part of calling to change because a lot of things haven't really really changed we haven't really seen the impact of change uh, that we need to see I want to see younger women young women 20, 21, being involved in fighting for a space. At this point, we're not just looking at breaking the glass ceiling. The, the ceiling hasn't been broken. We may have a few women in power, but the impact is still not being felt down here. And I need to start seeing young women take space. Mm -hmm. Young women start occupying places and start to know that this country also belongs to them. We cannot be a country that 1% of land is, is all that women have. Who's going to break the stereotypes? I need to start seeing young women take up spaces actively mm. in politics and see, you know, in all these spaces. Because then maybe we can form a more equal world. But right now, mm -hmm. badu. I like the passion. I actually feel motivated <laughs> <laughs> to do that. Uh, I, I know you do a lot a lot in the community with the with the violence and everything. So how do you deal with that? You you seem so calm. <laughs> and um, um, okay. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. um, debriefing. Um, I do a lot of debriefing. And for me, debriefing looks like different things. There's a day I just woke up last week and I went to Karura and I shouted at the trees because oh. I felt like... Mm -hmm. Even my therapy wouldn't understand me at that point. So I just mm. went and... So you do have a therapist? Yeah? I do. I have okay. a therapist. Mm -hmm. But okay. it's not just that. There's frustration that comes when you're in this work that you feel like nobody is understanding you. Like even if I'm telling my therapist this, mm. they don't understand how I have to go hustle with the police, I have to go hustle with those I have to hustle even with the, own, the community itself. You know, sometimes you're fighting... Uh, let's say somebody has been, has raped someone and you're fighting the community and you're telling them, look, you can't ban this person or you can't kill this person. Mm -hmm. So not only am I fighting for the rights of the survivor, yeah. I'm still fighting for the rights of the perpetrator because that's what that's the work you do mm -hmm. as a human rights defender. It can't be that this person needs to go through justice. Mm -hmm. So the community is like, where, where, how to attack So sometimes you get so frustrated and you feel like, I just want to go shout. So part of the things is self-care. And self-care looks like different things to different people. But for me... Mm -hmm. One of the places I find my own solace is in Parura, where I go, talk to the trees. Sometimes <laughs> I feel like the trees, yeah, the I'm sun. so tired of human beings. <laughs> I just want to go be, sit beneath the trees and just talk to them. Maybe they hear me. <laughs> and, you know, just different things that I do. I do yoga. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I go to a therapist because debriefing is very important. And, yeah, things around that. And I play battle games. I know. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an avid RPG player. Oh. I play battle games. I okay. kill people there. I feel very nice. <laughs> <laughs> that person that did something. Like yes, this, and yeah. I cannot do it in physical life. I mm -hmm. can do it in video games. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a time like you reach to your limit and you are yes. just like, this is enough. I can't have it anymore. Yes. And when that happens, mm -hmm. I take a break. So mm -hmm. what I'm doing this mm -hmm. now to just even protect my own mind is I don't take calls after seven. Should be six. I'm I'm working on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't take calls. I've Is there someone been, who st stands in for you? We have time? a call center. Okay, but all that when all is said and done. 
because my number is in the public sub, it's in the public domain. A lot of calls still come through my line, and even for the people in the call center, they still call me. So I have mm. they, they are st- there are things that they can't handle. Yes, and they it's need not even the things they in. can't handle. Mm-hmm. There are things that they feel because I've been doing this. Mm-hmm. I have the expertise to be able to navigate their way. So, yeah, one of that's one of the ways I'm protecting myself. Okay. What yeah. about your family? Is it supportive? How do they deal with what you go through? Because I I am sure they get to experience something. One of the thing the therapy has taught me is to leave my work outside the door. And it's hard. It, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. I've I've really worked on it. I've really worked on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying a lot not to explode on the people around me. Not so good, but I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, we still have those incidences where you feel everything is overwhelming, and sometimes it comes out even when you don't want it to. Yeah. yeah. Wait. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so as we come to uh, the conclusion of our discussion today, I know you've not exhausted, we're not even close to exhausting the discussion. Uh, would you uh, maybe say some of the support that you, you need or rather you, will, you, you need to do your work around uh, supporting or rather fighting against violence against women and girls, especially with the organization, which we've not mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what kind of support we need funding mm-hmm. we need let me let me let me let me just be honest I tell people three things the three things Osekimi needs mm-hmm. Osekimi is the organization that yeah. I work for uh, we need three things skills because when I rescue you from a situation let me give you a good example last week we rescued a girl who was being gang raped the reason she was gang raped is because she was home she was home because her mom couldn't afford school fees for her Right? Mm-hmm. And by being there, she was Ali Tumwa Kwaduka. And when she was sent to the shops, unfortunately, one of those things, Ali Chukuliwa Ju Kwaju, I mean, I work in the ghetto, these things happen. And it's the police who found her because Ali Kwanam Sako, so they found her. Mm-hmm. So do you see how the cycle works? Yeah. Now, for me, for this girl who is 14 year old, what does she need to do? She needs to go to school. How do we make that happen? We need money. So we need skills, we need time, and we need money. Those mm-hmm. three things. Yeah, so we ask mm-hmm. people, do you have time? You can have time, you can come, mm-hmm. sit with us, our survivors. You have something that can inspire somebody. Do you have skills that you can teach? Maybe mm-hmm. you're an economist. You can bring your skills to a micro level and teach people mm-hmm. how well to do this. You have money. Somebody did. And today, just as I was coming here, somebody called me and told me, hey, that girl you're talking about, I'm willing to take her to school for the next four years. And that's how we wow. work. So the, how is the reception with the, with the support? The, 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 it depends. Okay. But I am, I'm going to say this. Kenyans mm-hmm. have been very supportive of Sikimi. I have to say our biggest funder has been Kenyans. That 20 yeah? shillings, 40 bob. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. That 20 shillings, 50 bob that mm-hmm. they sent to mm-hmm. Mchanga mm-hmm. does a lot. Oh, you can speak about the Mchanga. Yes, That's for we do have an audience. Yeah. We have a pay bill number, 891-300, account to Sikimi oh. that, yeah, people actually send to. And with that, we've been able to influence a lot of change that you see us doing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, Njeri, for, for today, for agreeing to come and be part of this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we hope something will be done, or rather there will be improvement on protection mechanisms towards WHRDs, and not only to them, but also now uh, violence against women and girls will reduce. Even as we celebrate the 16 days of activism, it's not only a on the, the 16 days of activism that we should fight against violence, but it's throughout the whole year. Yeah. So thank you for listening in. I've been your host for today, Angeline Gitonga. Bye. Bye.